What's up, y'all? Welcome to Conversation Piece with Patrick Armstrong. I am the titular Patrick, and this is a show where we talk about the missing pieces of the conversations we're already having. Shout out to our returning listeners, and a high five and hello to everybody joining us for the very first time. I appreciate each one of you being here with us in 2024, the year of the nap. My guest today is a content producer who is passionate about delivering moments. Whether it's polished social content, events, or promotional pieces, he will enhance your story. I can personally attest to it as he's done it for the show for the past two months numerous times. Uh, He's also a seven times marathon runner and the founder of Mike Lee Productions. So let's tarry no further. He is the man behind the camera, Mr. MLP. It is an honor and privilege to welcome my brother, Mike Lee, to the show. What's up, dude? Man, that, that's always a hell of an intro. And it, it's <laughs> weird It's weird that it's it was about me. Uh, and it's also weird to be on this side of the table because I'm usually behind the camera. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, how but, does it feel to be <laughs> in, on the mic? Yeah, I mean, it, feel, it feels good. And I think like 2023 and 2024 really is the year of, you know, being transparent and really talking to your audience. Um, So this is a good step. I mean, if people have been following you on social media, you have been very front of camera, I feel Mm -hmm. like, recently, especially Mm -hmm. this year. Um, So it's not like you're shy about it. Right. You got, you, you can speak, you, you can speak very well. Get getting better at it. And as you know, the blooper reel would be way too long. Like, (laughs) yeah, that's the thing. Like the blooper reels take up some space on the old hard drive. Yes. Um, but I love, so before we jump into it, I love your speaking voice. I think you got a great speaking voice. People always tell me that, but I rarely get the chance to say the same thing back. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a very smooth, calming voice. If I were to listen to something on the call map, I would (laughs) listen to Mike, Mike Lee read it. Thank you. Thank you. And and it's so weird because I also was talking to a friend and she's all about like energies and like wavelengths and sound. And she's like, there's actually a difference when you're being authentic Mm. versus when you're being fake. Oh, sure. And it's like a lie detector, really. And I I think, you know, you you have a great podcast voice and just like the radio, like talent, so to speak. So uh, I appreciate the compliment. I appreciate that. Whenever anybody says you have a great like radio voice, I always think they're saying you have a great face for radio, which means <laughs> you don't have a great face. So <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. Um, all right. Before we dive into the meat of this conversation, mm-hmm. I did give you that introduction, but for anybody else out there listening or watching right now who doesn't know who you are, do you mind sharing just a little bit more about yourself? Yeah. So obviously content producer, I don't like saying content creator just because I feel like that's being overused nowadays Okay. and just having the production side of it. It's like, I'm not just showing up and creating content, but I also am producing it behind and had actually thinking about the strategy Mm. into the video and photo. And I always say like, your, your content is only as good as the strategy behind it. Like sure. you could have a killer video, but it's not going to perform well if you don't market it. So that's why I've been adding the producer role to it. And it also, you know, presents the value in my pieces. And that's why I also say polished social media content. Mm. Uh, just because, you know, you I, I want to be over delivering when I'm, you know, uh, like creating and just okay. like to represent a little bit more value than uh, and just kind of making myself stand out. Okay. Uh, do you feel like adding polished makes it seem like you're going to over deliver, mm. or do you feel like because isn't the saying under deli- over promise or no under promise over deliver? Mm-hmm. Do you feel mm-hmm. like polished takes it a step beyond under promising mm, and yeah. makes it maybe more of a promise? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think. The, the standard should never be, like, the goal. Right. So if if you already have high standards, I want to just be above the high mm. standard. You You're know? moving the bar right. up. Right. Okay. Right. Because I, I like feel it. like if I move the bar, then that bar is going to be eventually sure. set higher for everyone else. Yeah. You know, and that's how you kind of build, build this industry and really just build people up, too. When did content first become a thing that you were interested in? Were you just a kid— on social media and then you picked up your phone and we're like, I'm going to make stuff or how did that, how did that journey start? Yeah. I was actually incredibly shy as, uh, as a kid. Like I never really wanted to be on camera or anything like that. I have like, I, I fell in love with the editing 
portion of mm. video production first. And I love just like the control aspect. I loved how meticulous you could be yeah. and create really anything that you want um, and you just really be creative in, you know, what you're thinking and kind of put what I'm like the mind on paper. Mm. Um, and so that is kind of how, where it started. I think in seventh grade, I was in a sports broadcasting class Okay, where we were, uh, like our big project of the year is to follow a team in our school, like a sports team around for the whole season create content for them and then at the end of the year at like the like fall sports awards ceremony they're gonna be like playing it like on the big screen so you're doing like a hard knock situation <laughs> uh for the nfl but in your middle school sports absolutely team. <laughs> yes what yeah. team did you follow uh so it was it was a variety of of sports but i really oh, okay multiple teams yep okay. yep so based on so like there were there were like the open and the close of the ceremony so you have to encapsulate all of the sports and i really liked that portion just because you know it wasn't the same sport every single day sure like you were highlighting different sports and being creative with how you're making them look good yeah, yeah, yeah um but then i remember like football was the most like desired sport to sure. to capture um so i i only did that a couple times just because it was it was so competitive okay yeah so you said you started in like the editing bay and you mm -hmm. fell in love with the editing process when did you realize like oh being the person capturing the content was mm -hmm. something that you were interested in doing yeah yeah i think i had a realization when i got my first gopro it was like the gopro 2 and i realized that then i was like an order to edit you kind of have to have video to play sure. with um and i remember going to banff national park with uh with my family one summer just like bringing that along and i was so obsessed with the fact that it was waterproof mm. and so like sticking it in any river possible and just like seeing what let's see like what you got um, and just being a kid and just really having that fire just to create. Yeah. Um, and I think that we as content producers always kind of chase that, that first feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you grew up in not Indianapolis, mm -hmm. but in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so for people who may not know what Banff National Park is, even yeah. though I don't think that's Chicago related, can you just... <laughs> Define. Yeah. Yeah. So Banff National Park, it's in Calgary, Canada. Uh, first time, you know, out of the country and didn't really know what to expect. It was a huge pull from my older sister, actually. Mm. So I was a homebody. I, I hated to travel. I hated going to like weekend getaways. I hated like church retreats or, you know, camps. I couldn't deal with that. Uh, so like family vacations were like once a year, I would, you know, leave the house. And my sister was super adventurous and really just got me into like the outdoors. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, the Midwest isn't the most glamorous sometimes. So going to somewhere like Banff National Park in Canada really kind of spoiled me from, from an early age. Yeah. Well, it's a big contrast to like growing up in the city. And I know you grew yeah. up like Northern suburbs mm -hmm. of Correct. Chicago, but but it's still a big difference, like, when you get that exposure. And it's funny because, like, obviously that became foundational in a way to what you do now because mm -hmm. you're traveling a lot. You go a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. um, not shy, I would say, uh, but somebody who <laughs> likes to go out and engage with folks, make friends and, and have conversation and, and create some really cool stuff, yeah. uh, produce some really cool content. Thank you. Um, you ended up in Indianapolis mm -hmm. uh, because you went to Butler. Yes. So yeah. what was that transition like from Chicago coming to Indianapolis and what were you going to school for? Yeah. So that was that was so interesting and that's such a pivotal part of my life. And both of my oldest sisters, they also went to Butler. And me being the stubborn younger brother, I was like, I'm not going to follow them. I want to make my own path. And I wanted to pursue uh, a career in digital marketing or like, you know, just video in general. And as I was touring schools, I'm like, 
man, Butler is really cool. Like, <laughs> like I could kind of see why Dana and Jess really picked the school. Uh, but the one thing that, that Butler didn't really have or it was an unknown for me was I was a huge runner or I am a huge runner. And I wasn't quite good enough to be recruited by Butler because Butler is D1. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was looking at D2 and D3 schools, but I was like, do I sacrifice the career opportunities to, you know, run at a D3 school, even though I was like, I'm not going to be a professional runner. Like that's not going to be my future. So really just kind of had to look and see like what's going to be the long-term goal. Sure. Um, And could I still run at Butler? Yes. Would it be a little bit harder? Absolutely. Um, But, you know, before I committed to Butler, I looked at, you know, half marathons, marathons and you know, I was like an 18 year old and just signed up for for a marathon freshman year. I was like, you know what? We're just gonna go for it. <laughs> Here in Indy, one of the yep. marathons. Yep. Which one? Uh, uh, so, Monument. Yeah. So the Monumental. Okay. Uh, so it was back in I think 2019, uh, and that was crazy because uh, yeah. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. First marathon ever. First marathon ever. And in high school, didn't really run a like a whole lot in like the weekly mileage. We were, like, our school was very low mileage oriented. So you were, like, a distance runner in track and Mm -hmm. you ran cross country? Yep. Okay. Yep. But comparatively to other schools, we were very low mileage. And I was like, yeah, sure. I don't really know how this 26-mile race is going to (laughs) go. Don't know who I'm going to train with. But that really, I think, just forced myself out of the comfort level. Sure. Um, and being like, all right, like we're just going to take this challenge uh, by the reins and seeing seeing what happens. Yeah. Well, like you said, it'll force you out of the comfortability of the homebody idea. Mm. You're already displaced from Chicago to now Indianapolis, so you're right. like trying to vibe with a new place. And running makes sense as to be like it's a way to explore the city. You yeah. get a chance, especially if you run distances. Yeah. Like you get a chance to just move through the streets, move through the different neighborhoods and, and get a feel for it. Um, what was that post-marathon experience like? And was it a high <laughs> enough to get you to be like, oh, I'm going to continue doing this? Because as we mentioned in the intro, seven times marathoner. Right, right. Uh, honestly, if you would have asked 18-year-old Mike Lee <laughs> that I would be at seven right now as a 23-year-old, I'd be like, you're out of your mind. Um, but when I crossed that finish line, it was the hardest thing that I've ever done, but I was like, when is the next one? When can I sign up? Uh, and just really kind of pursued that feeling. Uh, and it's also, you know, running is therapy. Like it is active motive, like active meditation for me. Uh, so like if I'm stressed or if I need just to like brainstorm for different ideas, that's where I really just get all of my like creative juice from. And like, if I don't run in a day, like I'll feel kind of anxious or kind of antsy. Okay. And so it's really just a time to decompress. Yeah. So really just kind of found purpose in long distance running and just really made that a priority, especially as I started pursuing my creativity. Any particular place that you enjoy running the most? Man, it it depends. Um, So I love like if I'm running by myself, just it's going to sound really boring, but like just straight down the Monon. Oh, okay. No, I feel you. So. I'm not boring to me. I'm like, I like the straight line because I'm like, yeah. okay, if I can kind of see where the end might yeah. be, that's great for me. The, the light at the end yeah. of the tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I could just flip my mind off. Yeah. You know, I don't have to worry about cars or, you know, like geese, sure. especially in the springtime. Man. That's crazy. Um, so yeah. You've never been a- attacked by a geese? Absolutely. Yes. Geese. Uh, so, so my good friend Corey and I, like, uh, we've been running since college. Yeah. A couple summers ago, we were on the canal path and heading towards Broad Ripple. And we knew the geese were bad, but, you know, it was, I think, like, peak spring, like, mating season for them. And yeah. we actually had two geese, like, fly at us from the water. And Damn. just like from the water, that's from far the water. away too. Right. Jeez. And I was like, man, like we're just trying to get by, you know? Damn. Um, but yeah, you just you just collect so many funny stories and you know, you develop these awesome relationships with people and because you're stuck talking yeah. to people for for hours on end. Like, what yeah, else yeah. are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah. Man, that canal path is dangerous for geese. Yeah. A hundred percent. We Absolutely. had a similar situation going to Broad Ripple one mm. time on bikes. Mm. It was not fun. No. Um, 
What's something that you've gotten from running, but maybe more specifically like running marathons? Mm -hmm. What's an experience or something that you take away from there that you wish everybody could experience or feel? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I, I think the, the distance of it, like the, so the reason why a little bit of history, uh, the reason why the Boston Marathon logo is a unicorn is because only 1% of the population will ever run a marathon. Mm. And so like, that's just such a, that's such an achievement. Yeah. And I think doing something really hard and really difficult and really just pushing you mentally, but also physically, mm. like they, they talk about the wall at mile 20 or mile 18. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it is so real where your legs just shut off, but your mind says, keep on going. Yeah. You know, so you have this cognitive dissonance and really it's an internal battle. Sure. So I think, especially as a creative, especially as an entrepreneur, you got to go through hardships. You know, you got to go like trials by the fire. Yeah. Uh, so marathons are just like a physical, tangible challenge that I have for myself. I like it. I like it. Um, and people can find a way, find their own challenges and ways to approach that challenge right. or approach those things on their own. It doesn't have to be marathons, Correct. but and you can find that feeling. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that. You just got to find the thing yes. that you can derive it from. Absolutely. And also the best thing about long distance running or, you know, just running in general is it's an effort level. Like you yeah. don't have to be, you know, the best of the best. You don't have to be a pro athlete. Sure. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to do the best that I can on this given day. And I like, that's, that's all I, I need to do. Like it's you versus you out there. I have ran literally just down the street and said, okay, that's all I can do. <laughs> and I've counted that as having went for a run. So okay, yeah. I'm counting that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm taking your advice and counting that mm -hmm, for myself. Mm -hmm. um, as you should. What is then like something that you take from running and how does that overlap with your content production you talked mm -hmm. about it being like therapy mm -hmm. or a way that you can kind of brainstorm ideas or de-stress from an idea or whatever it might be how else does it overlap in the mm -hmm. work that you do yeah yeah uh so i think like i always talk about setbacks i always talk about you know like when you hit that wall like what yeah, are you yeah, going yeah. to be doing so like when you're when you get injured like that's a tangible barrier in your life mm -hmm. but like, how are you going to maneuver around that? How are you going to be adaptable or flexible? And I think that is such a unique trait um, of distance athletes or just, you know, people that move, like, move, like physically move, like, their bodies. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if a client tells me no or, you know, you forget a tripod or you forget something, like, how are you going to adapt to the situation based on what's, like, in front of you? Yeah. Any specific situations that come to mind about, like, <laughs> oh, I really had to pivot and adapt to something that mm -hmm. I was just not prepared for? Yeah. Yeah. So a little bit of a crazy story uh, <laughs> back uh, back in the pandemic. So I qualified for both the New York Marathon and Boston Marathon. And since it was canceled the year before, mm. they were like, you could either like prioritize 2021 or 2022. And I did both in the same year. And the Boston Marathon got moved to the fall that year to, you know, uh, because it was canceled last spring. Mm -hmm. So I had about three weeks in between both marathons. Damn. And I wasn't ready for the first one. Boston was first. Uh, that's one of the most challenging courses, um, you know, in the country. Yeah. And I was, you know, I don't want to say hobbling into it, but I was not. <laughs> sure. I was not 100%. coming off injury? Yes. Okay. Yep. So coming off injury and just didn't know how that was going to go. Yeah. Uh, and then three weeks later, I run New York and eight minutes faster than Boston, which wow. was crazy. But it's like, what are you going to do when you have such a, you know, a challenge ahead of you? Yeah. Like fight or flight. How are you going to adapt? You know, talking about recovery, talking about, yeah. you know, mindset. And, you know, ever since then, I was like, okay, if I could do that, I could find a way around like practically anything. Yeah. That is wild wildly, dare I say, unhealthy <laughs> yes. to run 52 miles. Absolutely. In one month. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's but, a lot. You know, that that's like, it, it is a comparison game sometimes. Sure. And I'm, I'm always like. You're young enough too. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, and you know, in hindsight, my, 
Did I run more that year? Maybe not. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> should I have done that? Probably not. Uh, my my dad definitely has been like, that was a dumb decision. Does he like, say that every time you see him? Yeah. Hey, remember that time you ran two marathons in one year, in Absolutely. one month? Yep. Terrible decision. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't that wasn't the smartest. Oh, uh, that's funny. Um, so, like, you find yourself building community through running. Mm-hmm. Um, you're here at school, digital marketing, learning new stuff. Uh, I'm assuming producing content throughout this whole time. Were you mm-hmm. produ- Did you start producing content for running and then move into something else? Or mm-hmm. was there a particular path that you took as you were producing that was more aligned maybe with school? Yeah, yeah. So Butler did a great job at facilitating learning like in the classroom, but I also took it upon myself to, you know, find freelance gigs, you know, for – practically free, you know, at that point and just really getting experience under my belt. Uh, I didn't know that I wanted to do, you know, running videos. Sure. Uh, Like back then, I just kind of had, you know, uh, whether that was a gig for a friend or, you know, a friend of a friend, that's kind of how it started. And just really taking anything that came my way. Yeah. Uh, And then now, I think in the past year or two, really just wanting to merge the two passions of running and videography. Um, so, you know, just kind of chasing that that feeling again. Is that the goal of kind of the work that you do is to be, uh, maybe this is not the right, a ru- like a running creative. Yeah. I was going to say like a running influencer, <laughs> but I don't know if that's the right description. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely say like maybe a running like, or like a content producer that has, you know, a focus in running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I never want to, you know, completely, you know, narrow in on sure. one industry uh, just because I'm passionate about, you know, events, coffee, cocktails, right, right, right. restaurants. Um, but I would love, like, I would absolutely love to just follow around a pro athlete for, you know, a year or two. Okay, um, so it doesn't even have to be yourself correct. creating the content. Yeah. You just want to be involved in running yeah. In 40% of your creative output mm-hmm. is like, that's the mm-hmm. focus. How yeah. does that normally break down for you? Like when it comes to what Mike Lee Productions is involved in, how do you mm-hmm. how do you decide, okay, I want to make sure <laughs> I'm doing Patrick's podcast. You know, we got to get that <laughs> hey, locked that's in. number one. That's number one. <laughs> <laughs> but I also want to make sure I'm following XYZ Runner. I also want to make sure yeah. I'm covering these events because I like them or because I know they're going to be a lucrative opportunity for me. Mm-hmm. How does that break down for you? Yeah. Well, first of all, Patrick Armstrong, always on speed dial. Like <laughs> when, when he... Do phones I, have speed dial anymore? <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, figurative speech, I guess. Um, but I just remember like such a funny story during All-Star Weekend. You're like, hey, Mike, like, you know, it's Thursday night. Can you be there like Friday at 10 a.m.? And I'd be like... <laughs> I think so, you know, and I always say like, I want to work with good people, you know, and like, here we are. Uh, Like this has been the great, like, I don't know, I've been meeting like so many great people and having so many great opportunities through you, who is is a great person, um, (laughs) obviously. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, like I want to have a a good balance of, of, you know, I guess clientele. But yeah. I always say, like, creators should probably have three or four different buckets that they pour themselves into. And so I really want to go after events, uh, restaurant and food, and running, you mm-hmm. know? So, like, those are kind of, like, the three biggest buckets that I have. But obviously, it's, like, if an opportunity presents itself, like this podcast. And I was going like, to say, I noticed that podcasting <laughs> was not one of your buckets. But those you, are just your three buckets. Correct. Creators should have their own three. Mm-hmm. Okay. Absolutely. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate it. And I think that's one of the reasons I was so interested in working with you, not just because I'd seen the work you'd done with Samson, shout Mm -hmm. out Samson. Um, But when we first met, just how interested you seemed in like what it was that was was happening here Mm -hmm. and also how organized you seemed to be. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. (laughs) I was just like, I feel like I'm organized, but for whatever reason, the people that I work with are always more organized than me. Mm. And I I think I do that intentionally because I know they're going to keep me accountable Mm. um, when I might not be as accountable as I should be. Um, And I got that vibe from you. And I feel like 
when I've watched as I've as we've connected and I've watched you work, what really stands out to me is like when you make a commitment to a client, like you are going to achieve what that client is requiring. Like when you did the NIT and the yeah. WBIT, Ooh, like yeah. you were turning around videos in six hour mm-hmm. time frames mm-hmm. that were high quality, that mm-hmm. were like very, very highly produced that looked like you had spent hours and hours and hours in the mm-hmm. editing bay in, in post-production. Um, but still we're then showing up on location of the day to yeah. capture more, to then do the same thing over again. Yeah. And I think that, I don't want to say it's rare, but I think it's, it's not something that you often see, um, particularly with people who find themselves in higher profile positions as mm. creative producers. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those, those two videos for WBIT and NIT, that wasn't in my like deliverables. Like that was just for me. Like See? that was just for fun. And you know, when you when you're in the lab, when you're in the editing bay and you catch yourself working like late nights and you're really tired, but you're like, I like I'm still going. Like, and that's when I really know like this is what I should be doing. Yeah. Like this is the gift that I've been given and I just want to run with it. Like figuratively and you know, literally. Yeah. You literally want to run with it. Yes. For sure. I like what you did <laughs> yeah. there. Um so speaking of that, like the last few months have been really um, high opportunity months for creatives in the city. From your perspective on the other side of the camera for this show, and then just in your time in the last few months, and then, you know, as you're in your career as a creator here in Indy, mm-hmm. what do you feel like you've seen is either missing from the scene of like the creative scene in Indianapolis that is now currently we are like working towards or what is something that you think we have been working on on the margins that we need to be centering more? Yeah, yeah. Um, It's always so funny. Like when I was thinking about this conversation that we're having right now, it's like, all right, what questions does Patrick usually ask? And like, how am I going to answer those? And so, you know, I am completely blanking on like what I... (laughs) Like, was was thinking about, you know, so we might have to cut this. But it's, I, I think one answer that comes to mind is we have so many creatives and just artists in general that are are on a nine to five schedule, mm-hmm. you know, and they're doing this, you know, from, you know, from five to nine or, you know, nine to, you know, midnight. And in their, and, but they, they want to be doing this full time. Yeah. Like, so how can we, we need these people to to really embrace their their creativity and their talents and just really just go for it. Like so many creators are on the fence. They're like, I don't know if I should leave my nine to five job and the comfortability that it brings. And I understand, you know, like you got to pay, you got to pay rent. You got to, you know, keep the lights on. And uh, like health insurance is a huge thing too, um, especially for freelancers. But it's like, at what point do you just go for it? You know, like you gotta, you gotta embrace change. You gotta sometimes like go past the person that you are currently to get to where you want to be. How do you, how did you make that decision? Because Mm -hmm. I would say like for you, at least as far as I'm aware, you have always kind of been in a position work-wise to do creative production, Mm -hmm. whether it's for like Indie Arts Council or Indie or Visit Indie or whoever mm-hmm. it might be, um, before you then went entrepreneurial and started NLP. Um, what was there a, what was the moment for you to be like, I want to go for it? Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you a lot of conversations with my parents. Uh, okay. So they had a somewhat of an understanding of what I wanted to be doing, but they were like, why would you leave your nine to five job? Like, so I, I used to work for the city um, over at Visit Indy and like no hard feelings to them. Like that was in, in an amazing opportunity right after graduation, really just got my foot in the door and really a lot of experience in the marketing and hospitality yeah. industry as a whole and how video and photo really kind of, you know, are mixed into the whole entire like agency model. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was like, I kind of have this itch for, you know, my, my own thing. And I always had Mike Lee Productions when I was over there and I was doing it on the side, you know, like, like I said before, like the five to nine grind or, you know, like after your five o'clock. And I was just like, there, there's no balance. 
Um, yeah. You know, I was I was pretty burnt out and just like doing long, long hours. And I was like, all right, if I could financially get there, if I could like have clients, clients that trust me and that are going to back me when I make this change, then so it was really just a trust between me and, you know, my, my clients and and the people that I work uh, with. Yeah. That that really helped me make the jump. Um, and my, my parents were like, I don't like we don't really understand what you're doing, but we could tell that you're really passionate about okay. it, and we want you to support. Uh, like we want they support, to support your passion. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. I so love it. shout out to Sonia and Mike. Shout Great. out Sonia and Mike. <laughs> Mike Junior. Uh, our Mike middle Jay? names are different. Okay. But you know, for like, yeah, I, I've been called Junior many times. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like that? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. No, I think. I don't think Mike Senior. I don't think Mike Mike Senior. Now I'm doing it. I don't think Mike will be upset. No, um, no. That's funny. I love that. Did uh, like, what was that first conversation with your parents like? Mm. Because we this episode's coming out during Asian Heritage Month here mm-hmm. in May, mm-hmm. and um, I think that there we're still dispelling this notion of the stereotypical Asian parent yeah. of like. You have to be a doctor, engineer, lawyer, mm-hmm. which is a stereotype and also isn't because I think it is still prevalent within the community. Yeah. Yeah. F- videography, digital marketing, the like digital p- content production, it falls outside of that. Yes. <laughs> those three oh, realms. absolutely. Uh, <laughs> what was that? What what have what have those conversations been like yeah. as you've created? Because like you have a really high quality product, so it's just Thank like you. it's. I think it's one thing to have a visual product to see, but it's another thing to try and like translate that. Yeah, to someone who doesn't like, especially generationally, has a different idea of what it means to be in business to pursue your own business. Yes, yeah, um, I'm I'm very grateful that my parents have always supported me, uh, like from day one. They I think challenged me because they supported me. You yeah. know, like if you love something or someone, you're gonna be a little bit harder on them, mm. you know, than a stranger. Okay. Um, so kind of having that tough love, but you know, also having that like support system in yeah, place yeah, yeah. where it's like the preface of we want to support you and do, you know, what you want to be doing. Yeah. Uh, but we're gonna ask you questions to to really make sure. Um, yeah. so a lot of different phone calls and just like like the logistics of it too. Yeah. Um, and I think it was just the repetitive phone calls of, I'm really passionate about this. Like yeah, I yeah, want to yeah. make the jump. Like I I feel like I'm almost there. Yeah. You know? Well, I think it shows interest too. Mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. that because it's like not many parents, they might ask, oh, how's it going? Right. But it sounds like they were going a little bit deeper mm-hmm. and asking like, like having a, taking a genuine interest in, what it is that you're trying to succeed at. Yeah. And, you know, I will also add, like, my parents were on the fence about it, but then also my sisters, they, I I didn't know this until I went full time where they had conversations with my parents. It's like, listen, like, we, like, I think Mike, because, you know, on social media, my sisters are going to see most of my work compared to my parents. Uh, And they're like, we see what Mike is trying to be doing or is trying to do. I think I think he's on the right track. Like yeah. I think this is going to be the right thing, um, and you know it, it was. It could have failed. It could have, sure. or it still can't fail. I guess. Um, but you know, just kind of riding this roller coaster and just you know really pursuing the gifts that I feel like you know are are given to me. Yeah. Well, I think it's that's the the inherent risk mm-hmm. of entrepreneurship is the the specter of failure. Yeah. And I think it's easy for people to be like oh let's go work at nine to five let's go right. back to corporate because it seems a lot more stable mm-hmm. um but there's the instability of your mental health of like the balance you yeah. know yeah. and then being able to pursue whatever you're passionate about mm-hmm. um so shout out mike and sonia <laughs> yeah shout y'all out you talked about how just going forward as part of this kind of like missing conversation missing piece of of this greater creator conversation especially for new creators mm-hmm. Um, what in Indianapolis do you feel like is available for folks to tap into when they are getting started? Is it a, you have to be plugged into a visit Indy or an organization that has the resources to fund you? Or is it like, 
if you think you've got an idea, go run with it in that direction. Mm-hmm. Or is it something else? Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think having that support system is really good in place. So whether finding other creators, like I started online, like yeah. just chatting with people in Indianapolis that were kind of doing the same thing. And now I have a really good support group with a lot of different people to have a sounding board off of. Um, and I think like my advice to creators or what I think is missing is like that encouragement just to go Mm. for it. And, you know, if you're, if you want to be reaching out to a business, like talk to people that are creating content for, you know, a similar business, how do they get there? How do they, you know, pitch themselves? How do they provide value? Um, so, you know, like talking about like Greg Buck that that's been doing this and is really successful at what he does. Like, Pick his brain. If he, if you want to run like a production company, like just look at other people that are doing it and that have been doing it. Yeah. Um, so I think like having that encouragement just to step outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. Because you know I'm I'm an introvert. Like I I don't really like that that fear of rejection. Like I yeah, think yeah, that yeah. that is so powerful sometimes. Oh, I like um, that. So it's like you gotta you gotta just like you gotta be. You can't be afraid of the no, I guess, sure. in a bit in a business format, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it's just because it's a no now, doesn't mean it's a no forever. Exactly. So just like a no right now. Yeah. Um. How do? What is your preferred method for people to tap in with you, mm-hmm. like as a new creator who's like, I want to learn from Mike. Yeah. Like, but and so this is something that I've struggled with. Like, I don't have any really never. Well, I never struggled with like the cold email, the cold message, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like I've always We've both been, done sales. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> However, I do also understand the introversion aspect of not wanting to reach out to somebody to learn because you don't want to come across as one of the followers who's just like trying to obtain free labor essentially. Yeah. So yeah. like for you, how do you prefer somebody get in touch with you to mm-hmm. be able to have that conversation? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like Instagram DMs, like I, I think have been really helpful for my own business, but also to build community. Okay. You know, I've gotten people that it's like, hey, like I've talked to your mutual friend and told me to reach out to you. You know, do you want to grab coffee? Like I will always grab coffee. Like no matter what, I love coffee. Uh, That's probably my weakness. Um, And, you know, just like chatting, just having like-minded people to talk to. Yeah. uh, Like that doesn't burn me out. Like that, that, is really empowering and that also builds community here. Um, and yeah, just like, I love the face-to-face conversations. So if you're in Indianapolis, like just, let's just sit down at a coffee shop and just talk whatever, you know? Okay. Mike is available to talk. <laughs> yes, if sir. you want, if you feel like he might not say yes, offer coffee and he will, <laughs> he just said what his kryptonite is. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, I appreciate that because I feel like, it is. It can be difficult, and like I feel mm. like a lot of creatives are introverts themselves. Yeah, I don't necessarily think a lot of people have a sales background, mm-hmm. um, where you're forced to have conversations and put on a face, you know. And I don't think necessarily that you have to do that in the creative space. I do think, however, it behooves you to to try and put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Yep. Um, specifically for your own benefit, not right. because it's like it's unsafe, but just because it's like, oh, it's just different yep. than what I've experienced before. I mean, we're also in the service industry, like That's the true. video production. That's and true. like when you're a freelancer, like you're providing a service. So like, how are you going to provide value to whoever you're pitching to? And how are you going to be different from everyone else? So like, that's why I say like polished marketing. That's why I say like, like content producer. Um, And, but it's like, how are you going to service, you know, whoever? Mm. Um, And I I think that's also really hard because you're combining your personal self and also your business self too. Um, And combining them sometimes is, is pretty tricky just because it's a double-edged sword. Sure. A hundred percent. That actually makes me think about like, it comes down to language and messaging. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that sets you apart is your message of like, you want to be a content producer who's passionate about delivering moments. Mm -hmm. And I like on your website, it says delivering moments in quotations, like, (laughs) like I'm delivering you moments. We don't know what that is yet. What was the first moment that Mm. you delivered? Gosh. Uh, probably, probably with that GoPro two. 
Uh, okay. Like that was, I think, the family vacation uh, in in Calgary. That was huge. Uh, but you know, when when talking about uh, like commercial, was there something? Well, real quick, was there something yeah. about that GoPro moment, like mm-hmm. that felt like this is a moment where mm-hmm. that became kind of like in the back of your mind, this is what I want to do. Yeah, I, I think I remember so vividly when I I was editing furiously. You know, I was like, I have all this so-called good footage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I look back at it now, I'd probably cringe um, (laughs) because it was so awful. Uh, But I remember showing my family and my sister was like, you should post this. And I was like, I never really thought about that. Mm, And like, at that point, like Instagram was up and coming, but it wasn't like a video platform. It was still photo. Yeah. So it was on Facebook, you know, and I think it probably got like 10 likes, but just that... That was like the first moment where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to avoid the fear of rejection or like sure. no. Uh, and I'm just going to like put myself out there. Yeah, yeah, um, So just like I said, having that encouragement yeah. to create and to put yourself out there. Yeah. Well, for you, it's definitely a moment because you can remember like, yeah. oh, Instagram. It like I, somebody saying you should post it and be like, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. You right. Know? And that's right. clearly sent you down a path to where it leads us today. What about commercially? Like what was mm-hmm. the first moment you delivered for a client where you were mm-hmm. like, oh, this is this is the the tagline on the website. Like, yeah. this is why I do this. Yeah. Um, honestly, like, I don't remember the first moment um, of, like, I guess, like, MLP. Um, Maybe not the very first moment, but the first moment that stands out to you as, like, this is what I mean when I say delivering moments. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was it was actually for a wedding company, which okay. is funny because I don't really advertise myself as a wedding videographer. But it was it was a proposal, mm. so it was a proposal for two strangers that I've never met. But it's like, man, it was the stakes were high. Yeah, you know, and like if you don't get the shot, that's 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 kind of on you, you know, like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that really would suck. And so since the stakes were so high when I finally got the shot and I made that video and sent it off to them, they were like, oh my gosh, like you delivered like that moment in time so well that Mm. we could use for, you know, the rest of our lives. And like, it's a timeless piece. So that's what I want to be doing for for everyone. And also I've been doing it for myself too. Yeah. Uh, Because when I look back at this stage of my life, I want to have like tangible things to look back on. Yeah. Oh, I love that that description of timeless because Mm -hmm. I have been trying to think of a way to describe the, the look, the aesthetic (laughs) of your videos and like even of your photos and even for this show. And I can't, I've not been able to like pinpoint it, but I think timeless (laughs) is a good one because it just like the, there's like some sort of, that's like the way I would describe this quality it carries. Like Mm. even the clips for the podcast, I feel like there's just like some timeless quality that 20 years down the line, this will work or 40 years down the line. This is going to still carry that same crispness. I think it's going to stand the test, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, It's, it's like you want to deliver it like how people saw it in person, but then you also want to add some style to it. Not only because, you know, it, probably looks better than, you know, what we see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also it's like, that's how you set yourself, you know, apart from others. Like I want, when someone is watching a video, they're like, Mike Lee made that. Mm. You know, like it wasn't just Did another you take that creator. From Samson? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, you know, shout out to Samson. Cause shout out Samson. He also supports a lot of different people in the city. Yeah, and just like, he, does. he was, you know, a really pivotal like hype man. Yeah. You know, so. for sure. He's always be sharing your stuff. <laughs> yes, put your does. name right on there. <laughs> yeah. Standing on business with that. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. it. Um, okay, I got a few more questions before we let mm-hmm. you get out of here. Uh, you know how you know how it goes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did want to just jump right back real quick to it being Asian Heritage Month. Yeah. You know, you come from Chicago, which has a little bit more of a dense diaspora there. Coming to Indianapolis, a little bit of a less dense diaspora, mm-hmm. but an existing one. Um, I was wondering if you could just speak about your experience from that perspective uh, here in Indy and then kind of what you might be hoping to see or hoping to experience this month, if that even is something that you celebrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think it's definitely something I celebrate. And even if it's not, you know, a physical thing, I think it's a mindset thing Mm, as well. Okay. 
Um, and whenever, like whenever you walk into a room, you're like, does, is there someone else that looks like me? Very true. And that is something so like subconscious that I'd never really realized that I did. Mm. Uh, but you know, if, if there's another, you know, Asian creator in a room full of creators, chances are I'm probably going to go to them, you know, just because like I'm familiar. Um, yeah. and like also like, I, I want to to set an example of like up and coming like Asian creators too. It's like, all right, like if Mike's doing it, I could do it. Yeah. You know, and I have those people for me as well in the industry mm. where I'm like, if if Matt is doing it, if, you know, um, if ironically his name's Michael, uh, <laughs> if, if Michael's doing it, then I could also do it. Right. You know? Um, so I think also like college was a really pivotal part too, just because, you know, Butler was predominantly a white, white campus yeah. and especially in the digital media entertainment realm, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of, uh, you know, minorities and just kind of like make, making your mark and, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you been able to find that community within the creative community here in Indy? Yeah, I think definitely it, it's, it's up and coming. Yeah. Uh, I think when we first met, I was like, also, like, you're also an Asian creator. Yeah. Like, I want to help you out. And I think when when creators individually succeed, then they also give back to the community. Yeah. And that's how we really kind of flourish as as a whole. Yeah. I love it. I do remember... I remember that first meeting very well. And I remember <laughs> you being, okay, I'm the only thinking of this because I've been talking about it a lot, but just like this idea of like, oh, there are other Asian people in Indiana. Yeah. It was, it was just like, you're just like, okay, there are other creatives in this that are also Asian here. Yeah. And yep. it was just like, yeah, it's got the wheels spinning on a lot of ideas that we are going to be involved in, hopefully, if you remain here in the state, yep. in the city. So Absolutely. I hope that you do. Yes. Um, all right. So speaking of just finding people that inspire you and finding people to be able to collaborate with yeah. and, you know, build community with, um, we have a new segment on the show called mm -hmm. Give Them Your Flowers, which is sponsored by Frida's Flowers, where our guests take a moment to give someone or something their well-deserved flowers. So, Mike, I just want to ask you, who would you like to give your flowers to today? Yeah, um, I would say definitely, like, my family. I'd say, like, my family and also, like, my girlfriend, Abby. Like, okay, shout and, out, Abby. <laughs> shout out, Abby. Uh, because I, I think when people ask me, like, why, like, why Abby? Or, you know, like, why are you still in this relationship? Like, she does a really good job, and so does my family, at, like, getting myself out of that business mindset. Mm. So it's, like, when we, like, when she comes over, when, like, we go, like, out to dinner— like, she just breaks down those walls so well. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm not thinking as, you know, a content producer. Mm. Like, I'm also a human that, that can do fun things, you know, yeah. outside of business. Uh, and whenever I'm on the phone with my family, too, they're like, how are you, like, as a person? I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I have things oh to God, do, I too. Feelings. You know, yeah, like, <laughs> whoa, like, what is this? And, like, all of them, they promote balance. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. like, yeah. You know, if it's a busy week, they're like, yeah, we could see that you're really busy, but like, are you happy? Like, mm. like what, like what is happiness to you? And like, you know, if, if success is happiness, then, then great. Yeah. What is happiness to you? That's a great, that's a great <laughs> uh, question. I don't think we have a whole lot of time to, to talk about okay. that. Oh, you got a long answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it, it's, it's, I think self-fulfillment um, and doing Love the it. things that like fill, fills your cup uh, and surrounding yourself with mm. people. Uh, because if you're, if, if you succeed and you don't have anyone else around you to share that success and that happiness, like, then what's the point? Sure. Like you have to share the happiness and you have to share everything to, to make it valuable. Mm. A hundred percent. That's why I love working with you. Yeah, thank you. That's um, because a it's a collaboration. <laughs> yes, it's a sir. collaboration. A hundred percent. Um, well, shout out to fam. Mm -hmm. Shout out to girl, Abby. Um, you got your flowers today. Shout out to Frida's. Yes. Shout out to Madeline, especially for sponsoring the segment. Frida's Flowers, providing bold, powerful, floral experiences that are sure to make a mark on your spirit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Love Madeline. We're going to have her on the show, too. All right. A few more questions. We're going to wrap it up here. The first one being, we had a conversation via text the other day where I said something. <laughs> I was referencing something in the sh in a shot of the episode. And I don't remember the word that I used, but it was not the correct terminology. Like videographer, like 
editing post-production terminology. Um, so I was wondering. <laughs> I have no idea where this is going. <laughs> I was wondering if you could share, and we laughed about it because it's like this, you said that wasn't the worst that you'd ever heard. So I was wondering uh, the worst kind of misused videographer <laughs> lingo that you could share, like that people tell you that you're like, that's not right. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, oh gosh, that is a great question. Um, it's always funny. It's not the worst because I think I'd have to think about that a sure. long time. But the most <laughs> frequent one, okay. uh, and maybe it's just a miss. Maybe it's just like an old terminology. But when people are like stills, when they call photos stills, mm. I'm like, I sure. Like when they're like, can you shoot stills as well? I'm like, you mean fo- like photos? Like just, just like. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I've never called it stills. I, I haven't heard, like, my generation say stills. So yeah. maybe it's just a difference in, in age. I don't know. That's funny. So you get that. <laughs> stills is the one you get a lot. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Which I think le- segues very nicely into this next and second to last question <laughs> about young creators. Mm-hmm. Like, or maybe not. They're in a boat. They didn't even use that word yet. The young producers, people who are interested in this. Um who are not yet ready to just kind of go for it, but are looking yeah. for the end. What advice, what words of wisdom, encouragement, what do you want to share with that person who's like interested on the cusp and looking into it and is seeking guidance? What 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 do you share with that person? Yeah. Um, I would definitely say like, well, what Greg Buck said on this, like you're going to fail a lot. But then to add on to that, uh, you don't know how creative you are until you don't have any options. Mm. So it's like the whole entire point of being creative is because you're not doing something that someone else is doing. Yeah. You know, so like being original in your craft, finding that creativity. And you got you got to be backed up against the wall sometimes. Mm. You know, it's like when you're in the editing bay at like midnight your intuition takes over. Like, you're sleep-deprived. Like, you're not thinking straight. But, like, you're just full sending it. And what you feel is is good. Mm. Um, so, I think that that would be my advice. Okay. Get your back up against the wall. <laughs> Have nothing to lose. Be in a terrible, <laughs> terrible position. And you will make the most creative thing that you've ever made. And it'll be worth it. And I will preface that. <laughs> I will preface that because it, I know you're spinning it. <laughs> but it's like you have to be ready yeah, yeah, yeah. for when life puts you back against the wall. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you don't, you don't pray for that. Right. But when it eventually does, you have to be ready for it. Are you ready for it? And if you're not ready for it, are you willing to go for it mm-hmm. at that moment? Absolutely. To try and get out of there. So, yeah. Mike, I appreciate that. I appreciate everything that you do for the show, Good. for me, for a bunch of people within this city. I think it's interesting to me that I, when I see your content pop up, who I see liking and commenting on it as well, who I've connected with, and just being like, feeling really happy yeah. to see that. And I'm hoping that a bunch of stuff spins out of this for you because you've got a timeless eye for the cool stuff happening in the city. And I I can't wait to see it archived a hundred years from now when I am 134. Yeah. And we are looking back and reminiscing. The the dad Um, lore is going to go crazy. (laughs) 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 All right. Before we let you go, um, where, what, tell people if you got something going on, what you got work going on right now, what you're working on, but where can people find you? How do we follow you? How do we support you going forward? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have I have a good amount of running content coming out, which is super exciting. But also, you know, we're talking about community a lot. Mm. Uh, so having a photo walk slash workshop in June. So June fifteenth, uh, June sixteenth is going to be the rainout date, just in case. But really, just engaging. It's an open invite to any creators. So whether you're filming on like your first camera or you know a cinema camera, it doesn't matter open invite. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be walking to different businesses around the city and having the opportunity and presenting the opportunity to pitch yourself and to talk to businesses so we Mm. can break down those barriers and break down, you know, the nerves of like cold pitching yourself. Mm. Uh, I love it. And also like experiencing different like categories of the industry. Hopefully it's going to be a really good turnout, you know, and if not, it'll just be me 
just just chilling with these businesses, getting content that Get, you know that content. you can use. So exactly, um, <laughs> but we're going for it. Yeah. You know, it's like you gotta you gotta support others and you gotta present the opportunity to create community. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. Where do they find out about that? Um, and where do they follow you at? Yep. So everything's going to be on Instagram predominantly. Um, and then we're also going to have a Eventbrite link where you could sign up. And when you sign up, you're automatically going to be registered for three giveaways uh, with the three vendors. Okay. So there's some incentive to, to showing up. Uh, and then obviously follow me on uh, Mike Lee underscore productions on Instagram and feel free to just send me a DM and message and we'll, we'll make something happen. All right. We will make something happen. I'm assuming that this stuff will be available by the time this episode drops. So we'll link Correct. it in the show notes yes. so you can sign up, get put in the giveaways and go have fun building community with Mike mm-hmm. and all the other creators in Indianapolis. It's going to be a great time. Yep. Mike, this has been a great time. I appreciate you stepping out from behind the camera. Of course. And sitting down with me <laughs> on, on the on mic today. Yeah, thank you for having me. A hundred percent. For everybody else out there, you already know episodes of this show drop every Tuesday on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram at Conversation Pod Peace. And make sure you follow or, or go to the website to catch up on the archives and everything else that's coming out. Conversation Peace Pod. Dot com. Just want to, again, shout out Frida's Flowers, shout out to Madeline, shout out to John Overton and Popular Rapture on the mic, shout out to Mike Lee on the mic and, and cameras, on the cameras this time. <laughs> um, shout out to Roundtable Recording as well for providing Studio A in this amazing space. Um, there is some really incredible stuff happening in May. If you're connected to me, you know what it is already. If you're not connected to me, then you better be following the show to find out. But until then, and until next time, I've been the titular Patrick, and this has been Conversation Peace. We'll see you all soon.